Welcome, everyone, to another episode of the Legends of Sport podcast. I'm your host, Andy Bernstein. Today's guest is Daryl Strawberry. Daryl played 17 years in the major leagues for the Mets, Dodgers, Giants, and Yankees. I met Daryl when he came to his hometown Dodgers in 1991, and I was their team photographer. We did some fun photo shoots together, which we discuss in this episode. Daryl was the number one pick in the 1980 MLB draft and was Rookie of the Year in 1983. He was an eight-time All-Star, four-time World Series champion with the Mets in 1986 and then with the Yankees in 96, 98, and 1999. At six foot six, he was a formidable and intimidating home run hitter and was also a dangerous base stealer and formidable outfielder. He's a member of the Mets Hall of Fame, but sadly may never reach Cooperstown as a member of Baseball's Hall of Fame due to his personal difficulties off the field. Daryl is very open about those issues and struggles, both in his book and during our interview on this episode. I thank Daryl for his willingness to share his story with all of us. Daryl played under a microscope in New York and LA. We talk about what that was like and how he was able to cross the borders between Queens and the Bronx to be a beloved sports figure to both Mets and Yankee fans, and the entire city of New York. I was intrigued by Daryl's new book, Turn Your Season Around, and how, as he says, he has switched teams and, quote, put on a new uniform, end quote, spreading the word of Christ as an evangelist. As all of you know who have followed Legends of Sports since we started, we are all about the stories behind the iconic athletes and personalities in sports. I am personally interested and want to share those stories of recovery and redemption with all of you. We don't take sides. We just want to learn because, folks, everyone has a story. And as our friend Kevin Love so eloquently says, everyone is going through something. Daryl's baseball career and accomplishments speak for themselves. In my opinion, he deserves to be considered as one of the best of his generation. And I hope he gets that coveted spot in Cooperstown one day. Daryl's new path is inspiring, and I recommend his book to all of you. He and his wife, Tracy, are dedicated to their mission and also give so much to raise awareness for autism and many other charitable causes. I hope you enjoy this episode. It was an important interview for me, and I hope you can all gain and learn something from Daryl's story and journey. And as always, I'll see you on the backside. So welcome, Daryl Strawberry, to the Legends of Sport podcast. Uh, so, so great to connect with you, man. Um, really happy you're coming on today to talk about a lot of things, but most prominently your, your incredible new book, Turn Your Season Around. And we're going to get to that in a few. Um, uh, I saw that uh, the other day on Instagram, on your Instagram post, that uh, I know you live in St. Louis, and it's got to be, what, about 10, 12, 15 degrees today? What is it? It's, it's probably 10 today. Oh, man, that's crazy. <laughs> it's, I'm in L.A., and, you know, the rest of the country, God bless it. I have a daughter in Philly, and she's just freezing to death. Freezing. Oh. Yeah, man, it's freezing all across the Midwest Brutal. and the East Coast. Yeah, nuts. So, Daryl, um, I don't know if you remember that we have a little bit of a mutual history together. I was the Dodgers team photographer when you joined the team um, in 91. And uh, that was it was incredible to have you out there. I'm going to share a picture that I did uh, of you and a buddy of yours. Me and Eric Davis. Of course. Yeah, you and you and Eric, right? That's you, a great picture. Yeah, that was on the cover of something. And I forgot what it was on the cover of. But, I think it was the cover of one of the Dodger programs. I think you're right. I think you're right. What was, what was it like for you to be playing together with Eric? I mean, I know you guys grew up together, you know, in uh, South Central, it was called at the time. Do you guys go to Crenshaw together or competing high schools or what? We went to uh, different high schools. He went to Fremont High School. Went to I went Fremont. to Crenshaw. Right. And uh, we played uh, summer ball together every year. With mm -hmm. Coach Earl Brown out in Compton. Yeah. And uh, we're a team called the Compton Moose. And <laughs> they used to say they used to say the Moose was on the loose. You know, Eric was a leadoff <laughs> hitter and yeah. I hit third in the lineup. Chris Brown hit fourth in the lineup. So it was a pretty powerhouse team. And, you know, I think most of the guys that grew up in L.A. played out in Compton. Eddie mm -hmm. and um, Ozzie and Lonnie Smith and Chili Davis. And, you know, all these guys, we've all played with Earl Brown, who was our coach. He coached those guys back in the days, too, when they played out in Compton and he coached us. And mm. It yeah. was just a phenomenal run of uh, so many Major League Baseball players. Hubie yeah. Brooks, you know, so many guys coming out of L.A. that played out in Compton. I had no idea that, that there were so many guys. It kind of reminds me of Gary Payton talked about on the podcast. He's a good friend growing up in Oakland. And his dad 
like coached all those guys who came, all those great NBA players that came out of Oakland, you know. Um, but I, I don't know. I did, probably you don't even know this, but um, I was assigned to do a shoot with Eric and we went back to Fremont High School. I spent the whole day with Eric um, when he was still with the Reds. And it was it was amazing, man. He, he so loved. And I know the two of you are. And are you guys in touch these days? I know he's back working with the Reds now or I don't know what he's doing. Yeah, we, we talk from time to time. I know he's working with the Reds and everything. He's living out in Arizona. So I keep in touch with Eric. Yeah. Eric was like my Eric is like my best friend. We grew up together. Mm -hmm. And our dream was, you know, getting to the major leagues and playing there and not just playing there, but being successful and playing at the highest level. So yeah. we had a chance and an opportunity to do that. And I'm so thankful for it. You know, uh, the friendship and the love that we have for each other and growing up together and being able to play Major League Baseball. Oh, that's so awesome, man. Well, the other thing we have in common, which you don't know, is that I grew up in Brooklyn. So my family were diehard Brooklyn Dodger fans. So when I was a kid, um, I was prevented from being a Yankee fan because they hated the Yankees, obviously. <laughs> so I had to be a Mets fan. Right. So I grew up during the whole you know, terrible time of the Mets, you know, from 62 until the amazing Mets in 69. And uh, I was 11 years old when when they won, you know, the World Series, the amazing Mets. And Gil Hodges lived like three blocks from me, the uh, the manager. And we kids threw a party and a parade for him down Bedford Avenue. <laughs> <laughs> it was one of the highlights of my childhood, man. It was unbelievable. Um, well. Yeah. Yeah. That was pretty awesome. Man. It had to be a pretty awesome time. You know, the 69 Miracle Match, they were incredible. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, you talk about it in your book and you talk about how um, trying to find the quote, but you, you said something about how 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 the world needed the amazing Mets in those days, right? That 1969, we had all the racial unrest, the, the protests about the war. The country was, you know, as it is now, you know, super divided. Um and the Mets came along at the right time. You know, are we are we back in that kind of era right now? Do we need another amazing Mets to kind of happen for us? Well, we need something amazing. No question about it. You know, you look back at those times and in the struggle of what our nation was going in. And uh, you look at the nation today and the struggle that we're divided, like you said, in so many different ways. And, and you know, it, it's just a broken system, a broken generation. And I just think a lot of people are, are really hurting and don't really have the uh, proper direction about life and how do we live and how do we live among each other? How do we see each other, uh, not color, you know, because one thing I could tell you is God is not looking at color. It's people that are looking at color of people and that makes it uh, the way we make it. And, you know, that's why we have the racial issues in, in this country. And, you know, hopefully uh, people can get their hearts settled and get their heart right and, and maybe have the right perspective or what life is really all about. Yeah. And then <clears throat> throw COVID into the mix, right? <laughs> On top of everything. And and you write, you know, it's amazing that you wrote this book during COVID, right? And it came out, you know, it was still in the pandemic. And you talk very eloquently about it. You, I'm going to read a couple of quotes. You, you talked about how the lessons of the pandemic, quote, reminded us how fragile life is and that death is no respecter of persons and everything everybody does has implications for everyone else. That one really hit me because it's true. You know, I'm here in LA. I'm sure where you are, um, you're seeing people without masks, you know, and people are, are respectful of other people's health, you know, and it, it bothers me. So, uh, well, it, you know. it's just a complete disaster. You mm -hmm. know, when you look, look at the whole circumstances of what, has taken place with the pandemic and and the way you know uh, people have went about it you know and you see like death is real you know so many people have lost their life uh, mm -hmm. just because what just because of of an illness that has come up on the earth and has left us in a place where uh, anyone could be uh, afflicted with it and you know if it does you know it can kill you I mean I'm quite sure we've all have had, had some type of experiences in this you know I know I did early and um last February I was very sick and I didn't know what it was. And then, and coming to find out it was COVID, you know, it was, mm -hmm. uh, it, and they hadn't, hadn't came out at the, at the February time. Didn't come out to like sometime in March when they really started recognizing where we was at. So, you know, there's, you know, there's a lot of us who could have lost their life and there's a lot who have lost their life and bless their hearts, you know, and, and you think, you think, you think of the time that we, we're, we're in, you know, think of the time of, of families not being able to celebrate the uh, celebration of one lost life. And it's just been a very difficult time for all of us to uh, kind of just put our 
thoughts together and think about, you know, what, what is really important? What are we really mm-hmm. looking at in these times that we're dealing in? Yeah. I mean, um, you, you talk about it in your book and I, I had a, a really great guest early in the pandemic, a woman named Lynn Goldberg, who founded this, uh, this great app meditation app called breathe. And she said, she said, you know what? Uh, God has given us a timeout. <laughs> He's given the world a timeout. You know, I mean, from your perspective now, Daryl, how do you how do you look at that in terms of God's plan with that? Well, he stopped everybody and he's trying to bring everybody back to a place of uh, learning to live together, uh, learning to live according to his principles, because I think we've gotten far away from that. I think we've come to a nation where anything goes and people can say anything and people can be any kind of way. And that's not the way he created this to be. I, I think a nation has turned their back on him. And I think, you know, it, it, it's a great result of what we're going through right now. I mean, because he can stop anything at any time when he wants to, because he's God, you know, he's the creator of all of this. And I think people don't think, take a moment to pause and realize, you know, I'm lucky. I'm lucky to be living in these times where God has stopped us and made us, you know, take a look at yourself. He's telling everybody to take a look at yourself. He's not just telling one or two, three people. He's telling zillions of people to look at yourself, examine yourself. What, you know, if your life was taken from COVID, where are you going after that? Do you really know where you're going? Mm-hmm. You know, and, and, and everybody think, well, I'm just a good person and I've done good things. So I should all be getting, to, getting into heaven. And God's trying to tell us, no, that's not the way it works. You know, he's talking about, you need to know who I am. You need to know my principles. You need to live by my principles and stop living according to all these worldly principles. It's okay to live a life and do what you do, but don't live according to these worldly principles and just accept anything. And I think we're a generation that has come along that just accepted anything and saying, well, this is just the way it is. I mean, you look at what's happening in California, where you're at, and, mm-hmm. and, and with people the people are divided. You look at New York, New York is going under, you know, because people are, uh, making decisions and they believe they're bigger than the, uh, the, the other people. And none of us are bigger than anybody. We all are equal and God created every last one of us. So, you know, a lot of people have lost their life and a lot of people are hurting behind people decisions. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Very well said. Um, Dan, I want to go back to your, your baseball career and I don't want to dwell on it because it's, you know, not really what I wanted to talk about today because I do want to talk about your book. But the thing that really struck me and being a New Yorker <clears throat> and knowing how like partisan New York fans are, that you either love the Yankees, you hate the Yankees, you love the Mets, you love, you know, you hate the Mets. The same thing in hockey and football, everything, right? You seem to be able to like walk that line effortlessly. I mean, you were a Met, you were beloved as a Met, right? You're in the Mets Hall of Fame. You go out to L.A., you go to San Francisco, you come back and become a Yankee. You win three World Series with the Yankees, right? Can you tell the story? Because it's such a great story about when you hit the home run in Shea Stadium in a Yankee uniform, right? Because <laughs> I, I honestly could not believe that that actually happened. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm quite sure a lot of people couldn't believe that actually happened in the Yankee uniform. Of course, when I came back in the Dodger uniform, I hit a couple home runs at Shea yes. Stadium against my former uh, team. Uh-huh. And, uh, but this time I was playing with the Yankees uh, because the Yankee Stadium had, had a crack and we were playing the Angels. And, and at um, Shea Stadium, we had to move a day game over there. And I hit a home run in the left field. Mm-hmm. And there it is. The apple starts to come <laughs> up. And, and as of the apple coming up and it gets closer to the Mets logo, boop, they pull it back down because they realize I don't have a Mets uniform on. I have a Yankee <laughs> uniform on. So, I mean, it was just a fun, it was a fun time. It was an incredible time being back at Shea Stadium. Uh, putting on the having a Yankee uniform on, I know a, a lot of Mets fans just, you know, it just really gets to them when I have a Yankee uniform or post it on social media. They really always talking about you a Matt. It's a, but I'm a New Yorker. I mean, I played for some incredible teams in New York. I played for some um, incredible Met teams and incredible mm-hmm. Yankees teams. So I, I'm always grateful for you know the fact that I had to play. And even the Dodgers, you know, I had a chance to come to L.A. and they were the Brooklyn Dodgers before they were, you know, L.A. Dodgers and playing for Tommy Lasorda. And, you know, I had I had incredible time there. Just, things just didn't work out. Injuries and then all I, all I started having the problems with drugs and everything else, you know, fell into place. And, you know, it just crushed my dream of everything that I wanted to I was believing in and wanted to be when I came to L.A. 
Yeah, 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 I understand. Um, and you write very eloquently in the book about the power of forgiveness, right? And New Yorkers are not known to be too forgiving. <laughs> but, but yet they, you know, I don't know, you are must be the exception to that because of, of all the trials and tribulations that you had, they, you are just so loved over there in New York, you know, in, in the Bronx and in Queens, right? The whole, the whole place. It's amazing. <laughs> it's incredible. It's yeah. incredible. I mean, it's incredible how the fans there really adore me and love me. And, and mm -hmm. I'm forever grateful for, for that. See, because New Yorkers are different. And I think people don't understand New Yorkers. New, New York is tough. And they know they know if you can make it there, you can make it anywhere. There's no question about it. Mm -hmm. And you know the fans there know that everybody in New York go through struggles. And if you can get over the struggles of your life living in a place like that, they just believe in you. And I think that's what it was for me. You know, they they saw me fight, 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 and never give up and never quit. And they just saw me continue to fight. And now they see me standing as a different person today. And they just they just admire the fact that you know. I was able to, you know, overcome so many things and, and become such a different person today. Even when I play, had the uniform on, you know, they always cheered for me. It wasn't like, the, you know, they were born for me to, uh, you know, not succeed. Mm -hmm. They was always cheering for me to, you know, make a comeback. And, you know, I made a lot of comebacks there. And and I admire New York City. I admire the fans. It's like I grew up there, yeah. you know, and I, and I know what it's like. I know what the pressure is like. It's not like playing anywhere else. You don't have all the media outlets like you have in New York. You know, when you go to the ballpark, you got 35, 40 media outlets mm -hmm. are there at the ballpark every day, just standing around looking uh, the writer story to see what they can come up with. So it, it's, it's very challenging. I tell players, you know, guys say, well, what do you think this guy want to play in New York? I say, be careful what you ask for, because you will get it when you go to New York. You're going to get the, you're going to get some people that don't like you in the media and you will get some that will like you. And how do you deal with that? How do you balance that out? Mm -hmm. you, have, you have to have a tough skin, man. You got to have a tough skin to play in New York because they love you. But when you're not performing or whatever, they're, they're going to give it to you. And the media probably worse than the fans sometimes, I think. Right. Well, yeah. Well, they write they write about you and the yeah. fans read about it. And But I but I love the fans because that's one thing about them there in New York. They're going to make you either, either they're going to make you play or mm -hmm. they're going to run you out of town. Yeah, yeah. That's the good thing about New Yorkers. They're not going to just let you stay there. If you suck and, <laughs> and they're going to really let you know that you suck, you need to get out of town. Yeah. Well, Dar, I love what you wrote about um, your connection with Gary Carter. And uh, I didn't know Gary, but of course, you know, I photographed him. I, I actually was, you know, photographing you guys when you were playing the Dodgers in, in the NLCS and all that stuff. Um, which was weird for me to go back to Shea Stadium where I you know, basically grew up. And as the enemy, you know, wearing a Dodger right. jacket, it was very strange. Um, can you talk about that, about how how Gary influenced you? And you talked also uh, I, I saw recently about Mookie Wilson and, and the influence they had on you. They were just two, two incredible people who mm -hmm. lived a different life um, from what most athletes live in that atmosphere. And they didn't make themselves better than anybody. They just lived the life in faith, you know, and, and mm -hmm. they, they were just a great example of what it can be like, how your life can be healthy and strong. And, you know, it wasn't about being the baseball player. They knew they were baseball players, but I think more than anything, they knew they were a man more than just a baseball player. And mm -hmm. I think that's what makes it so different when you play sports and, and you see athletes and you see guys that have such a high standard of who they are as a person and a character the way they live. They don't live a light life. They don't run around chasing women. They don't go out drinking. Uh, they're not drinking on airplanes and, you know, they don't use uh, wrong words. They don't say things in such a bad way. Like, you know, most guys do, they don't talk about other people, uh, but they have this standard and character about themselves. They live under these biblical principles. And I was just in awe of that to see a guy that can live that, that had a high profile like Gary Carter and Mookie Wilson, you know, throughout their whole career, you know, mm -hmm. this is the way they lived their whole career and they didn't change after their careers were over. And you find some guys and see some guys, you know, live that and say that they, that's who they are. But all of a sudden they change after baseball's over. And, and I, I was able to witness these guys never change from the time that they were playing and the time that I saw them and the time that I saw their careers were over, they were still the same with the same character. So I was really impressed with that. And I was just like, you know, wanted to be what they were at when, when I was in the midst of playing, but I just didn't have the guts to ask them 
how is it that you guys live such a calm life and play at such a high level? Mm, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's so, so, so tragic that Gary died so young, you know, but uh, the joy that he brought to the game. I mean, you talk about him smiling all the time, you know, of course, he had a catcher's mask on, but <laughs> you could you could kind of <laughs> tell he had a love for the game like like maybe nobody else that I really encountered. I think yeah. what it was more than anything, Andrew, it, it was the love for life mm -hmm. uh, that that was he was free on the inside. It wasn't just the game. I mean, he, of course, he loved the game and he was great at it. But mm -hmm. the joy for life was a real freedom to him because he didn't have the bondage of living the life and the weight of living the life of being a professional athlete and, and trying to achieve all these things. And when you do achieve them, what's next? He already knew what was next. He already knew that his faith was in God. And Mookie was the same way. He knew that his faith was in God. They would go out to dinner with us. And, mm -hmm. you know, we'd be on the road and they go out to dinner and they say, well, I'll see you tomorrow after the dinner was over. And they get in the cab. Most of the guys going out to yeah. hang out and party and girls and stuff like that. And these two going back and say, I'll see you at the ballpark tomorrow. And then they go see you at the ballpark the next day. And mm -hmm. they don't condemn you. They don't talk about anything. They just love you right where you're at. It's, it's incredible when you can have guys that you seen play at that level and understand that they live a different lifestyle and they have compassion, you know, too, at the same time mm -hmm. for those of us that they know one day, hopefully can come to this place and have this freedom that we have. Yeah. So, so let's talk about that. Let's talk about that moment for you, Daryl, because, you know, it's so well documented, the demons that you were dealing with um, two bouts with cancer, colon cancer. The second one you talk about in your book that you just didn't want to go on. Right. Was that bottom for you? Because, you know, I've, I've been in recovery I'm in my 20th year. Right. And I, I remember bottom <laughs> and I, <laughs> I don't ever want to forget the bottom either. And you talk about that in the book, which really hit home. Um, well, you I get it. Yeah, you don't. You don't ever want to forget the bottom of life. You know, cancer wasn't it. You know, I ended up in the Florida State Prison with a T17169 because of addiction, mm. uh, because of my troubles and, and with the law and everything. And that's where addiction takes us. It, it takes you all over the place uh, and it keeps you longer than you can ever imagine. Mm -hmm. and, and and that's what it did for my life. And, you know, I think the bottom was, you know, when it was little over 18 years ago when I was still in the midst of addiction and my wife, Tracy, she's got 21 years and she never went back and we met in recovery and she was pulling me out of dope houses in South Florida. You know, I was shooting dope and smoking crack and she was banging on doors, pulling me out of dope houses and, and saying, God's got a plan for you. And I says, why don't you and that God just leave me here and let me die. She said, you are just not like that lucky. So what I learned through that process was God was always going to do what he's always done. He was always use people to help people. And she was the person that was leading me back. And she led me back to my life and to church and to God and led me forward that way. And I'm forever grateful that God would use her and, and, and guys like Gary Carter would be an example. And my mother would be another example. See, I had examples of people who loved me in, even in the midst of my craziness. Mm -hmm. And so, so you, I had so many crazy bottoms. So I finally hit the f final bottom when Tracy was pulling me out. And we, then we moved to St. Louis in the middle of nowhere. She says, I'm moving back home to St. Louis. You, either you're going or not. I said, I'm not going to St. Louis. No black folks live in St. Louis, you know? <laughs> and I was, and I was in the midst of my addiction. I was thinking to myself, I'm not going into Cardinal country, you know? That's right. They hate, they hate ex Mets in St. Louis. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I was like, there's no way I'm going to St. Louis. And, right. and uh, little, little did I know that I would end up in St. Louis and my whole life would change. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, you also talk about your purpose. And I don't read a quote because you wrote it, but you know, but the listeners don't know it. He said, uh, quote, my, but my purpose was more than hitting home runs and winning World Series championships. God made me for an eternal purpose. And that that is very reminiscent to me of my good friend, Magic Johnson, when he announces HIV, um, that he contracted it. And he said, God has a plan for me. He put me he gave me this virus so I could help other people. I mean, it really, do you see that for your, yourself as well? No question. I think God allowed my platform to be what it was, to have this stardom and, and go through these horrible conditions of life, you know, struggles. And, and then he would find me in a pit and he would pull me out of the pit himself mm -hmm. through people. And he would put me in a pulpit to preach the gospel, which I'm not qualified to do. I never went to school. He called me from right where I was at through the broken pieces of who I was mm -hmm. and, and, and called me into ministry to be a totally different person. After years of sitting 
and and developing, you know, through the word and stuff like that. Little did I know that I would turn out to be evangelist, uh, just like Billy Graham. He told me to study Billy Graham when he called me. And I started studying who Billy Graham was and saw that he was an evangelist and he was a soul winner, that God would use me, you know, from my broken pieces of my life to become a soul winner, to share the message of the gospel, to help somebody else. And I mean, he, he's got a plan, you know, we just don't know what it is sometimes. We think it's our career, the trophies and all the success, but what people don't understand all that's going to pass away and you're going to pass away too. What would your legacy be? Well, I, you know, and, and I realized that my legacy would be different than what I thought it would be. I thought I would leave a legacy of the baseball and the trophies, but it wasn't. It was like the legacy that my mother left for me, that the Lord Jesus Christ was Lord. And I'd be able to leave that for my kids because that's what my mother left for me when she passed away at the age of 55. And I was broken. And she just said that God's going to get you and he's going to do what he needs to do in your life. And she told me, she said, you're going to go through it. But she said, God said he's going to get it out of you. Mm. Yeah. And you, you write about how you know, it took basically 15 years for you to fully embrace Jesus in your life. Right. And that uh, you have a couple of great quotes. You said that you switch teams and that now you wear a different uniform. Right. <clears throat> and then you also have this great acronym for uh, for RBIs. You call them spiritual RBIs. Right. Realities beyond imagination. So. Realities. Yeah. So it must be it must be interesting for you and for people who listen to you to, to sort of take your baseball life. Right. And bring it into your spiritual life. Do you do that in your sermons a lot? Do you kind of bring both worlds together or you kind of leave baseball where it is? Of course, I bring that in because that's who I was. And that's what most people identify me as, you know, and they mm -hmm. remember me from that. And they look at it and saying, well, what if it could have, if I could have, should have, there's no, if I could have, should have, I am who I'm supposed to be today. I, I have a greater position today than I had as a baseball player because I had get to have a greater impact mm -hmm. on people's lives. You know, we have impact on people's lives in a baseball game and, you know, you hit home runs and they're going to go, they're going to cheer. And when you win ball games, they're going to cheer. But when you go home, you know, they forget about it, you forget about it. And then you got to come back the next day. But the things that I get to do today when I get to preach the gospel and, and do an altar call and where people are hurting and need a victory in their life and they come down, that's the reward because that becomes eternal. It doesn't become earthly. It becomes an eternal decision that you're making. And that's what happened to me. I made an eternal decision, you know, when I finally decided that I was going to go this way. Andrew, it doesn't make me better than anybody else. It just means I made a different decision mm -hmm. than most other people, you know, who stayed around sports and, and, and lived in it, you know, and continue to live it. And I just decided I didn't want to live in sports anymore. I had did that for a very long time. And I'm very thankful for all the things that sports had given to me. But baseball lessons in life gave me a lot to be the man I am today, mm -hmm. you know, from the lessons that I learned in that. And I learned that I didn't want to be this anymore. I didn't want to live like this anymore. When, and that's when I started reflecting back and I started looking and saying, look how Gary Carter and Mookie Wilson lived in the midst of baseball. A lot of people don't, like I said before, they don't live their life like that. Mm -hmm. We live it kind of fast in a sinful way, women and this and that, and you get, you get stuck and you get stuck. You, and I always say, you can pick your sins, but you cannot pick the consequences behind it. Mm -hmm. And there's major consequences behind my sinful ways. And I'm glad that I got over those 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 sinful ways and started living a different way and started living according to the biblical principles. I'm grateful for God's grace. Mm. Yeah, I, I love how you uh, you call sin, S-I-N, self-indulgence now. <laughs> Isn't that true? <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah. <laughs> we all we, we all know how true that is, you know, if, oh, really, yeah. uh, if we really understand what we live outside of our body and, and how we live it, yeah. uh, it, it. It's a way that is deadly um, and we indulge in it uh, to make ourself feel good and satisfy our soul. But at the end, you know, at the end, we all, all don't understand. If you don't, you don't understand it until you actually connect with God and realize that it's meaningless at the end of the day. You know, everything is meaningless that we were doing from a sinful nature. Uh, and, and it means nothing. You know, we think it's a lot when we're in it and doing it, but it means nothing. It means death and it leads you down a dark road of emptiness. Yeah, for sure. Um, 
Daryl, you also talk about in your book towards the end that um, you have a quote. You say, when I was living by the world standards, I was insanely popular, but it's a different story today. The overwhelming majority of Americans reject my biblical views. So is how discouraging is that? Is it discouraging? I know you and Tracy, you know, you spend a lot of time out preaching and you're on the road. Um, you know, what what is life like for you and, and how do you how do you deal with what you call rejection? Oh, I deal great with rejection. You know, I, I was always strong in that area of my life. If I was weak in that area, then I wouldn't be able to be in, a, in the position I'm in today because, mm -hmm. you know, I got a lot of rejection when I played. You know, people didn't like me. Players didn't like me. And, and that, that's just the way life is, you know. And, mm -hmm. and I realized that, you know, when I got into ministry that it was going to be a lot of rejection, a lot of criticism. People were going to not like you because you don't talk the same language they do. You're, you're not hanging your hat on your baseball career. You've moved completely away from that. And I think I, I think a lot of times a lot of people don't understand that, you know, that that's they don't understand that you're a different person. And, you know, and, and you have to be able to know that the importance of that is good. If I'm rejected. It's good. It mm -hmm. means I'm doing something right, you know, because I remember when I started this journey uh, a little over 18 years ago, I remember everybody saying, yeah, he's going to follow God. He's going to live a different way. Let's see how long this is going to last. And it's been 18 years, you know, mm -hmm. and I haven't looked back, you know, and they, they still curious, you know, what happened to him. You know, it's, it's, I found a new way of life and I live a different way of life to encourage people in a different way. That's all it is. Mm -hmm. You know, Daryl, um, having watched some interviews with you and talking to you right now, there on your face is like a, a, a really a, a, a sense of contentment. And you talk about contentment in your book. And um, is that where you're at right now? You, you feel content with your life? I'm totally content with my life. I, you know, it's the peace that surpasses all understanding that comes from God that dwells inside of you, that gives you uh, understanding that this is not home. Mm -hmm. I think so many of us get consumed with, earthly status and we don't know what's next that all we do is know what i have what i'm doing and what i'm achieving and we don't see beyond that um it's like when you come to understand that personal relationship with christ it, it separates you from that and it gives you the perspective of understanding that this will not last this this body here will not last here do the best that you can make the best out of every opportunity, help as many as people as you can love as many as people you can. Don't point fingers at people because they're going to point them at you, but don't point fingers at them. Just, you know, I, I saw that with Gary Carter, people were persecuting him and saying, look at him. He's smiling. He's happy all the time. Nobody could be that happy. Yes, you can. When you're free inside, you can be completely happy. You don't have to have any kind of demonic forces pulling you back into any darkness or anything. And that's what it is for me. I'm totally content with my, my day to day life and who I am and who God created me to be. Oh, I love that, Daryl. Thank you. Hey, Daryl, the last thing I want to talk about is your work in the autistic community, uh, very near and dear to my heart, uh, my nephew, my, my sister and my brother-in-law's son, uh, an autistic adult. And, um, you know, we're, they're very involved and I try to help as much as I can. Can you talk a little bit about what you and Tracy do in the uh, autism community? It's a, it's, it's such a wonderful community that, that needs great help and, and great attention from people who are not affected with autistic children because autistic children are very special in a very unique way. And I think people don't really understand, you know, who they are because they, they don't take the time out to know the history of what happens um, to the kids and everything. So we got involved with that with my wife's sister here in St. Louis many years ago. And we just had a foundation where we just started raising money and, and just giving it to them. Didn't have a staff, just had a golf tournament mm -hmm. and started raising money and, and putting, you know, putting money together to give directly to them to do what they needed to do to help, you know, kids with, with autism. And when you learn from families who have a child that's affected with autism, you hear the real deep struggle of how it is to take care of a child. And you see so many people getting divorced because they didn't sign up for, you know, this. And it's unfortunate that you, you have a child. And I, I, I tell you, me and Tracy just love autistic children. I think they're the most special people that God has created and put here on earth for us to be able to look at ourselves and says, look at the joy of who they are inside, regardless of what condition they are. And they're very intelligent. They're very smart. They have great wisdom and knowledge about all kinds of things that most the average person 
wouldn't wouldn't have. So what what happened to us is we learned the fact that let's introduce ourselves into their lifestyle, not us, you know, them being in our lifestyle. And I think mm-hmm. that's why we got so attached to it. Oh, I love it. Well, listen, you can count on me, Legends of Sport. You need anything, any kind of um, silent auction items, anything we can do to help, you know, photography services. I'm there for you. So you let Thank me, you. You know, <laughs> if you come through L.A. in any way, you know, I'm happy to help in any way I can. So thank you. I appreciate that, Andrew. Yeah. That's All awesome. Right, man. Hey, Daryl, um, the last very last thing is the acronym in, in the book at the end where you took your name. Right. And you you put like what it was then, what it was like then and what it was like now with the letters of your name. I love that. And I sent that to some some very close friends uh, and we had some fun with it over the weekend. I got to tell you, and I'm just going to give you the one the first letter of my name, Andrew. Right. The A asleep to awake. That's all. I'm gonna leave it at that. <laughs> well, that's, that's good. That's good that you start. You know, because we did that for hopefully people can recognize, you know, yeah. you know their name and, and add to it, mm-hmm. um, you know, from what where you were at and where you are today. Absolutely. And, and, and we are in such a different place and different time in our life. And, and we're looking we're looking at a society, like I said, Andrew, that is that is struggling deep, deeply mm-hmm. to have freedom on the inside because everybody can say they look good from the outside. But I think on the inside, people are in fear, people are in doubt and don't know you know what's next Mm, i hear you man well daryl i can't thank you enough man for coming on today i mean it's such a great conversation and uh you know i was a big fan of yours when you played i got to photograph you we're going to post pictures from when you with the mets i didn't get to shoot you when you with the yankees but i obviously the dodgers so that'll be you know part of this and of course this book we're gonna you know tweet this out and i wish you the best of luck with the book and with everything you and tracy are doing man um following you now religiously i guess you could say on instagram (laughs) (laughs) well thanks well hopefully what's your instagram handle you know and i can yeah pick it up on you yeah, yeah. It, I got two at ADB Photo Inc. That's like all my photos that go back, you know, my 40 year career and then at Legends of Sport. And I'll share that. I'll share that with uh, your manager who helped set this up. And um, and maybe you and I can, you know, communicate offline here because I think, you know, we're on a, we're yeah. on a great path together, man. I'm, I'm, it's just amazing what you're doing and, and how you've turned your life around. And, um, you know, as a fan, as a fellow human being, I'm super proud of you and very happy for you. Thank you. Well, I'm really grateful to Daryl for sharing his story and journey with me today so I can bring it to all of you. His book is a deep and honest account of his life's mission now, and I highly recommend Turn Your Season Around. Thanks also, as always, to my producer and researcher, Veronica Ahn, and thanks everyone for continuing to download and subscribe to our podcast. A reminder that you can find us on the LA Times app and online, as well as your favorite podcast platforms, including Apple and Spotify. Please keep following us on Instagram at Legends of Sport, our Twitter at Legends underscore of Sport, our blog is legendsofsport.blog, and our TikTok and YouTube channels, Legends of Sport. You can find my photography on Instagram at ADB Photo Inc. So thanks, everyone. We'll be back in two weeks with another great guest and episode. Please check our social media for the announcement. And until then, stay safe, stay well, and of course, Wear your mask. See everybody.